If there's one word that sums up the long-term effects of COVID-19, it's uncertainty. How do we combat that? How do we get our collective heads around what the hell SARS-CoV-2 is doing to our bodies? There's really just one answer, and that is research. But before that happens, we need recognition, and from the bodies that matter. Now, nine months in after the appearance of this novel coronavirus, just where are we at on that front? Well, things are finally starting to move. Let's catch up. Recent weeks have started to see not just the media, but the medical establishment starting to take notice of long COVID. Dr. Tedros, Director General of the WHO, says, we hear you. In August, the British Society for Immunology published this, the long-term immunological health consequences of COVID-19. It has become clear that infection with SARS-CoV-2 may be responsible for previously unexpected long-term immunological health consequences. It's been pretty clear for some time, but thanks for joining the party. A few days ago, The Lancet published this piece by Dr. Nisreen Alwan, calling for greater surveillance of the condition. We must measure the proportion of cases with prolonged ill health, not only to provide support and care, but also to redefine the true effect of the pandemic and inform the appropriate response to it. I couldn't agree more. It's a pity that political pressures aren't driving governments more towards this kind of action. Just as this film was going to press, the British government has finally just acknowledged the condition, displaying a fairly comprehensive description of how long COVID can manifest. But no signs on here about what they're going to do about it, beyond the Your COVID Recovery website and producing pamphlets for primary care. There's also a link to a longitudinal international study, ISARIC, which I wasn't previously aware of. And now, picking back up before I interrupted with the government news. On the 3rd of September, the BMJ held a webinar discussing some of the big questions around the condition. What do we mean by long COVID, post-acute COVID? What are different perspectives, experiences, categories? What do we know about how common it is? What might be the pathophysiology? What are the best approaches to management? And what data should we be collecting? What research should we be doing? An excellent panel had some superb insights, and we'll come to some of those a little later. But first, let's talk a little bit about that pathophysiology. In my last film, I spoke a little bit about the huge range of symptoms and about the spectrum of COVID-triggered conditions that might be responsible. I since talked to Danny Altman, Professor of Immunology at Imperial, about his thoughts on what might be going on. Uh, I'm just going to let him talk here because he's great. The list of symptoms is enormous and they're very diverse and they can affect almost every part of the body with quite diverse levels of severity. So I can, from things I know from other diseases, I can picture all kinds of possibilities. Um, one outlier that I'm not sure about is people saying, well, perhaps some of it is virus lingering in the body with some kind of lingering chronic virus reservoir. So intuitively, I say coronaviruses aren't known to do things like that. But on the other hand, every, every other time I've said, you know, this doesn't normally happen, I've been wrong. So it could be that. Um, the, a simple hypothesis for a lot of things that are being talked about, a lot of quite severe things that are being talked about in the central nervous system, in the lungs, in the heart, in the kidneys, is that the receptor for this virus is this thing ACE2. ACE2 isn't only in the lungs, it's in many, many parts of the body, including the blood vessels, for example, that's the strokes. Um, so almost anywhere in the body that ACE2 is expressed, virus can get in, can cause damage, can cause scarring, can cause fibrosis. So I'd love to see a lot of look-see imaging, um, MRI imaging, CT imaging, to try and correlate symptoms with organ damage um, in the brain and spinal cord, in the lungs, in the heart, um, you know, in, 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 in the kidneys. Because I think that will explain perhaps a large subset of disease and then we'll have to work out what to do about it. And then you mentioned the kind of um, immune system hypotheses. So we've got a lot of um, examples previously about how a virus can come into your body and kind of let off a hand grenade and com completely unsettle your immune system so that strange things start to happen. Um, so in very different ways, good examples of that would be this chikungunya virus that I mentioned before, 
would be um, glandular fever caused by Epstein-Barr virus, would be cytomegalovirus, another related um, herpes virus, would be Ebola virus. So all of those are examples where even when you've survived the acute attack, um, your immune system kind of never looks the same again, and certainly not for many years. And there are consequences of that, um, sometimes um, inflammatory, sometimes impaired immunity to other things, and sometimes um, full-blown bona fide autoimmunity. Professor Altman wanted to see more MRIs of COVID-affected organs. And funnily enough, in the BMJ webinar, Dr. Puntman made a presentation showing how her team's research had found that up to 78% of non-hospitalized COVID patients had significant myocarditis. That is, inflammation of the heart muscle. But this inflammation only occurred later, once the virus was no longer present. Why? Well, the immune system. Who gets long COVID? And why? This is still a really big question. But first, let's jump back to that BSI report. Every individual's immune system is as unique as their fingerprints. And so different people can respond to a virus in different ways. For example, with greater or lesser collateral damage through inflammation. The immunological responses detected post-SARS-CoV-2 infection are incredibly variable, from lots to virtually none, even between people who are demographically similar and clearly PCR positive. Are there any indicators to show who is more likely to develop long COVID during the early acute phase of a SARS-2 infection? Well, it seems that yes, there are. In that BMJ webinar, Professor Tim Spector from King's College London showed how their enormous data set of an N of 4 million had found first week symptoms predictive of long COVID. Yes, there were the standard respiratory symptoms of shortness of breath and cough, but also headache and GI issues, along with hoarse voice. Uh, now this resonates with me because headache and GI were probably the two symptoms that defined my first week the most strongly. What about that other official symptom of fever? Well, not specifically correlated with a probability of developing long COVID. And anecdotally, from the small sample around me who had it at the time, uh, they all got a, had a horrible first week actually with fever and cough and are now fine, whilst at the time I was feeling quite smug because I thought I was getting away with a relatively mild case. Uh, now, of course, the tables are turned and I'm feeling, six months on, rather less smug. One other interesting insight from Tim Spector was that the data they found from people who had positive PCR tests was very similar uh, to those predicted to be positive by the app. Uh, that is to say, uh, symptoms are a very good indicator of infection. Here's the BSI talking about the most commonly reported symptom of long COVID, fatigue. We do not yet understand the underlying pathology. Three possibilities have been suggested for long-term effects after infection by scientists at Yale. Patients with long-term symptoms might still harbour infectious virus in some reservoir organ not identified by nasal swabs. Also, persistent fragments of viral genes, though not infectious, may still be triggering a violent immune overreaction. Alternatively, although the virus is cleared, the immune system continues in an overactive or perturbed state, analogous to the long-term debilitation after glandular fever. Three good hypotheses, but how do we test them? The answer is, of course, clinical and academic research. Where exactly are we at on that front? Well, back in June, the digital technologies company Perspectum launched CoverScan, one of the first longitudinal studies into COVID recovery. CoverScan will take 500 people recovering from a COVID infection and use blood tests and MRI scanning to observe changes to various organs, including the lungs, heart, kidneys, liver, and spleen. I haven't quite been able to work out whether these participants are all long haulers or just anyone who's been COVID positive at some point. The post-hospitalisation COVID-19 study, or FOSP, is the first UK-wide study to assess the impact of the virus on patient health and recovery. This is an 18-month, 10,000 participant study aiming to understand why some people recover more quickly than others, why some patients develop health problems later on, which treatments received in hospital or afterwards were helpful, and how we can improve care of patients after they've been discharged from hospital.
Whilst it is excellent that this £8.4 million clinical study has been commissioned, it does only look at people who were hospitalised for COVID and not community long-haul COVID sufferers, who are the vast majority. Also, those research questions are rather broad. Fortunately, the call for research into the condition has been heard by the wider community. This piece by Yellen et al. was published in The Lancet on the 1st of September. The number of people affected by COVID-19 is unprecedented. We owe good answers on the long-term consequences of the disease to our patients and healthcare providers. The obvious answer is in research. We've compiled a list of questions we think should be answered. This list is based on the author's views and experience, rather than on the literature, which is scant. Here's the list as presented. Ones I believe to be particularly pertinent. How can we help people with long-term complaints? Physical therapy, nutrition or medications? How long will they suffer? Can we predict during the acute disease which patients will develop long-term consequences? As mentioned earlier, Tim Spector does have some data on this, but I feel like there's a little bit more room to dig a bit deeper. Are there features of the acute disease which predict long-term consequences, or underlying diseases which put patients at risk? There may be people with certain conditions who aren't particularly at risk from acute severe COVID, but could be at risk from chronic long COVID. If I was one of those people, I think I'd certainly want to know. Are there management strategies of the acute disease related to the prevention or exacerbation of the long-term consequences. There's general agreement on the avoidance of too much activity once you're suffering from long COVID, but imagine if there was something you could do to prevent long COVID during the acute phase. In the BMJ webinar, Tim Spector talked about as soon as possible starting clinical trials for various treatments, potentially like steroids, uh, to see if they could be applied at month one and reduce the chance of still having symptoms at month three. This is exactly what I was talking about in my last film. We really need those clinical trials as soon as possible, in much the same way as we had the NHS recovery trial that identified dexamethasone as having a positive impact uh, for survivability of the virus uh, once you were critically ill. And the next question, will the people be infected again? And when? I'd extend this to say, are long COVID sufferers more or less likely to catch uh, COVID again than people who just experienced it with a short illness? That is to say, is the bell curve for long COVID sufferers slightly further along or further back than it is for those who just suffered a short illness? Is there an infectious or inflammatory explanation to the prolonged disease? I had two thoughts on this. You can either start the therapeutic drug trials and use the results of those to inform the thinking uh, and direct the investigations about what actually might be happening inside the body as a result of which drugs worked. Or you can try and do the research to find out what's going in the body and then use that research uh, to inform the drugs trials about which drugs you should be trying. My suspicion is that the former is probably more time efficient. The letter also details some of the requirements and design for the research, as well as a list of observed symptoms. Not as comprehensive as some of the lists, but a solid start. I also spoke to Professor Rob Copeland, Director of the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre, to ask him what research questions he'd like to ask. What are the mechanisms um, of this disease that um, we can identify that can be influenced through rehabilitation? Um, and uh, so is it the inflammatory response for example which has been talked about a lot and are people with long COVID um, through a phenotype susceptible more or less to, to inf inflammatory response and if they are um, therefore what can we do to, to help identify those people and then support them through rehabilitation to be honest one of the other questions I, I really you know it's top of my list but is incredibly sensitive is what's the role of physical activity and I've been really cautious about this. Uh, you know, I, I run a research centre that's all about physical activity. And I don't think I've ever been more cautious about talking about physical activity in my entire life because I'm convinced that you can't uh, run away from this. You can't push through this. Because if you could, you'd you know, um, known your background, you'd have done that already. Um, and yet I do think there is a role for physical activity in the broadest sense. I do think there's a role in terms of um, this fine balance between deconditioning as a result of doing nothing for a long period of time and managing fatigue through pacing. And that, that 
um, so the st me for the, the other research study would be what is the um, the, the balance, where's the tipping points for individuals and does that differ across the population? That deconditioning versus fatigue. Absolutely understand. I mean, for me, I think the challenge here, and I completely agree with you on the deconditioning front, but you have to then be doing something. So if your, activi your, your activities of daily living take up this much energy and the amount that you, of energy you have is this, then you've only got this much left to do that exercise in before you're inducing some post-exertional malaise. And, for so, and you never know on any one given day whether you've got this much or whether you've actually got less than that. And everybody's different, not just between each other, but on any given day. So yeah. actually trying to work out where you can squeeze that activity in. I completely agree with you. It does have a role. Yeah. But trying to judge how to insert it into that yeah. gap is the challenge. Yeah, and that's the question. And I think this is where we're trying to get use of objective data to be able to support people to have a um, a clearer picture of where of what their baseline looks like is there any research that you are doing at the moment regarding long covid we currently have underway a lived experience study where we're speaking to people in depth with long covid not necessarily just here's a list of symptoms that you've you know articulated but what's it actually been like um, and therefore what would matter most to you during your recovery and therefore we can start to build rehabilitation that might not necessarily just be about managing fatigue but you know it could be also about being able to have conversations more effectively with an employer because you know the fear associated with uh, not being able to return to work is part of the exacerbation of symptoms and stress and um, fatigue so it's complex really and you know we need to understand those narratives a little bit better as well as the mechanisms and the, the you know the um, pathophysiology in order to be able to design effective rehab programs in my view and this really boils down to the question that's at the top of every long haulers list how do we get better well research should help until now, the leaders in the battle for understanding of long COVID have been the patients. The patients have been driving the research, they've been fighting for recognition and trying to find out on their own what works for rehabilitation. But it does now seem that the medical establishment is starting to come on board, and that is very good news. We just have to hope that we start to get some answers sooner rather than later. I asked Rob Copeland what positive news he saw for long haulers out there. I think the first thing to say is we are seeing people recovering. We are seeing people get back into physical activity, but it's taken a lot longer, vastly longer than people would probably be um, prepared to um, uh, admit. If right at the beginning we said for, for you know, 10% of the people who get COVID, it will be a 12-month recovery process, it completely shifts how everybody views it. So we are seeing people recovering. That to me says we need to understand more about what they've done and whether that is because they've just... You know, had it for longer and now we are seeing a natural progression of recovery or are there things like I talked about this po positive deviance that they are doing that are effective we've seen investment so the FOSP study which is okay it's about acute um, admissions but um, uh, the calls that have come to extend that to long um, COVID and community-based stuff I think is encouraging so there is some investment in it and some of the feedback that we've had on our uh, work around fatigue you know suggests that we do know some of the things that uh, that help. So this idea around you know, managing your energy effectively and, and the potential role that, that technology could play in helping people to do that more effectively, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. So if you, like me, are still struggling with long COVID, then keep pacing yourself, don't overdo it, and keep your spirits up, because it certainly doesn't help to have them down. Till next time. <laughs>